Welcome and thank you again for joining. My name is Tracy Carluccio and I'm with Delaware Riverkeeper Network and I'm working with our network tonight to bring this webinar to you. The webinar is Frack Gas Bomb Trains Through Philly. Uh, the Philadelphia groups that are uh, working on this issue are represented here tonight through our various roles. Uh, Philly Break Bus, 350 Philly, Physicians for Social Responsibility, and Delaware Riverkeeper Network. Our agenda tonight, quickly, just for housekeeping, we're going to have a brief overview and an introduction to a map that shows the most likely train route through Philadelphia, and I will be doing that. Then we will have an LNG rail car transportation safety presentation by Bob Elbeck. Then Philadelphia neighborhoods that are gonna be in harm's way will be addressed by Fermin Morales. And what's wrong with LNG and what we should do uh, instead by Adrian Rivera Rez. And the Stop LNG Trains petition will be introduced by Mitch Channon. And the question and answer period will be led by Tammy Murphy of Physicians for Social Responsibility. We'll close out at eight o'clock and we're gonna honor your time and try to stick to that one hour uh, schedule. So let's get started. Um, first of all, um, I'm gonna give a brief overview so everyone knows the context of what we're talking about when we discuss um, these trains that they're planning to send through Philadelphia. Um, and this is abbreviated so you can ask questions in the chat or go to some of the links that we, we will be uh, supplying during the webinar in the chat box uh, in order to get more detailed information. Um, the proposed export terminal, uh, the Gibbstown Ex LNG export terminal project is very large. It begins in the Marcellus Shale Fields in North Central Pennsylvania, where gas wells would have to be fracked in order to produce the gas for this. And then the shale gas would have to go by a pipeline and be liquefied at a plant that they want to build in Bradford County up in North Central Pennsylvania on the Susquehanna River. From that proposed plant in Wyalusing Township, trains and trucks would carry the LNG over about 200 miles through hundreds of communities, cut across Philadelphia, across the Delaware River, and down to Gibbstown and Greenwich Township, New Jersey on the Delaware River. From there, it would be transported in enormous ships, larger ships than it have ever transported out of the Delaware River um, today um, this far up in the estuary. And those ships would go down the Delaware River and overseas for sale. Um, New Fortress Energy, the company who was trying to build the project, received a special permit from the federal government to transport this liquefied natural gas or LNG by rail car from Wyalusing to Gibbstown. This is the first and only permitted transport of LNG by rail cars in the United States of this magnitude. And it is the only project that would liquefy gas in the shale fields and move it over land to a terminal, transloading directly from the rail cars and the tank trucks into waiting ships 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, seven days a week. No agency has done a full environmental impact of this project. And no agency with liquefied natural gas expertise has examined the safety and public health impacts of all of the tentacles of this project. We'll hear more about these threats from our speakers. The special permit to New Fortress Energy subsidiary for the trains through Philadelphia followed an executive order issued by President Trump to lift the long-standing ban on the transport of LNG by rail. And that ban had been in place for so long because of the safety reasons, and it applied all across the United States. And President Trump said he was doing this to push the export of liquefied natural gas for the industry. There wasn't even an environmental impact statement or a full transportation risk analysis done. And this permit, however, was given. And after that, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Administration who issued that permit also adopted a general rule, a federal rule that now makes it legal for any rail car carrier to carry LNG by train tank cars anywhere in the nation. Now, we're not gonna go into that rule tonight except to say this rule is being fought and it will hopefully be pulled back by the Biden administration. 
They have no skin in this game in terms of what the Trump administration did. And we think that it's possible that the Biden administration will pull back the LNG by rail. And we're gonna hear a little further about why we think they will pull back the special permit that was given as a gift to New Fortress Energy by the Trump administration. Um, also just wanna note that this permit that we're talking about tonight, this transport of LNG, LNG from Wyalusen to Gibbstown that goes through Philadelphia is due to expire November 30th. So we believe we have an opportunity, a special moment now to load up to the Biden administration how unpopular this special permit is, how we know it's unsafe, and we believe that they will actually respond if they hear from enough of us. Um, now, just to, to finish up a little bit of context here, um, the Gibbstown LNG terminal has not been built. Uh, it has been delayed, but it would have been built already if there hadn't been an outpouring of opposition to the project over the last two years, over 70,000 petition comments for instance, submitted to the Delaware River Basin Commission, uh, who gave the, the first permit for this. All three major permits granted for the construction of this project, the Delaware River Basin Commission, the Army Corps of Engineers, and New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, all those permits have been appealed by the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, and there are additional approvals needed from at least three agencies, and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is reviewing its jurisdiction of the project. All of this could greatly change the timeline for this project. It is possible that they could begin construction this fall, but we, uh, as things stand right now, they're not ready to do that. The last mention I want to make is that stopping this reckless endangerment of the people of Philadelphia and the region's communities and environment is grounded in a larger effort that effort is to stop fossil fuel projects and the release of greenhouse gas emissions that are, that are fueling uh, our climate crisis. And as we know, methane is the most powerful of greenhouse gases on a 20 year time scale. And if we don't reduce emissions drastically in the next eight and a half years, scientists say we'll, we will lose the battle to save the globe from climate catastrophe. So the fight to stop this is huge. And the web of negative impacts is huge, but it is painfully local. And that's what we're focusing on here tonight. Now we're gonna take a look at a map that shows where the rail cars would travel up to two 100 rail cars every day. And um, I'm just gonna take a few minutes to show you those. In order to do this, I'm gonna share my screen and show you a couple slides uh, in order for you to, to get a picture for what this is gonna look like. Can you all see my screen? Thumbs up? Okay. Um, all right, so this is an interactive map and um, Delaware Riverkeeper Network's um, staff person, uh, Peter Tran is gonna be putting in the chat tonight links to these various things we, we are referring to here. But this interactive map um, is of the LNG transport from Wyalusing down to Gibbstown. And this is zoomed in on Philadelphia. Um, and I'm gonna move the map a little bit so you can see, but I want you first to just take a look at where that red line goes. It comes down the west side of uh, the Schuylkill River and it travel, that's traveling from the north, north, where it has kind of gone along um, parallel to um, the, the turnpike. And as it comes down, it goes through Fairmont Park, the train tracks, and then it goes over the bridge there. And then you can see it crosses the Delaware River and it enters uh, that part of Philadelphia. And as you, if you look at the, um, at the uh, red line, you'll see that it travels um, following the train tracks there um, at North 32nd Street at just south of the reservoir. And then the train, it the train tracks follow um, after that uh, West Glenwood Avenue and it travels east in a northerly direction um, uh, east. And as it travels it, that way, it turns, it turns and it goes, and I'm gonna see if I can move the map for you. Um, 
Yeah, it turns. And um, as it uh, turns east, it goes along uh, East Marengo Avenue, and then the tracks bend south to cross over um, Aramingo Avenue and Route 95, and then it crosses the Delaware River at the Del Air Bridge. Um, and then uh, that, that bridge, as you can see, uh, parallels, goes right next to the Betsy Ross Bridge. Um, and there's, a, there's uh, over 1.5 million people uh, that would be affected in this region should there be a derailment. And we're gonna hear from Bob Elbick in a little bit about why, uh, how, how real that danger is and why so many people would be affected. But I think that, that what I wanna show you here is if we look at this rail route, and by the way, the interactive map shows four different routes. We're only looking at the rail route, but there's a truck route that you can zoom in on. There's a, 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 the one that we think is most likely is called truck route A. Truck route B is a, the second most likely route that they will use for the trucks. And then this is rail route A, and there's also a rail route B, which also impacts Philadelphia, but takes a little different route. But we're looking at this one for simplicity tonight. I'm gonna click on this and show you, this is where this, this area that just blobbed out in pink and, and mauve, that area are where people of color and minorities live. And you can see that the very intense, um, a dense, I'm sorry, the very dense population of people of color in this region within what's called, what we're calling the two mile high hazard zone. It doesn't mean that the two mile is anything outside of the two mile uh, high hazard zone is safe, but it means that these are the areas that will be first impacted and mostly, most intensely impacted should there be a release of liquefied natural gas, um, like from a trail derailment, for instance. Um, and then also now I'm gonna click on this, this other layer, which shows you added into and on top of um, those population areas are low income areas. And you can see um, that that very closely um, corresponds with the, the population areas of people of color, uh, black and brown communities, um, but it also um, it is a little bit different in that uh, it shows people who from, uh, from all different walks of life and all different um, populations that, um, that would be affected. Those dots that you see, just so you know, those are schools and they are daycare centers. So they're all throughout the area where this train would go and the high hazard zone is, the zone that would be impacted within minutes, should there be a derailment, uh, is filled with uh, schools, daycare centers, um, both adult and children, and with populations that are already overburdened with environmental um, insults. So uh, this is the, the, the map. Um, I'm gonna zoom it out so you can get a little more context here. Um, and as we go outwards, you can see that the route, if I turn off these layers, you can see it a little better. Um, the, the route uh, goes all the way up and moves up to Wyalusing. in the shale fields of Pennsylvania. So thank you very much. Um, I appreciate your um, taking a look at this with us. Uh, we feel that this is um, threatening the people um, of our region uh, in the millions. And we believe that we can stop this project, um, but we're gonna say why uh, from the presenters here tonight. So um, just now to, uh, move over to our, our panelists. Um, I'd like to, to uh, introduce to you Bob Elbick. And um, Bob Elbick is a Lehigh County commissioner. He has uh, a, a bachelor's in science and mechanical engineering from Lehigh University. He has five years experience with air products, manufacturing gas liquefaction equipment. He has 15 years experience refurbishing and repairing cryogenic transport trailers. This is his area of expertise. He has seven years experience designing pressure equipment. Um, and he also has five years experience as first responder firefighter with hazmat training. 
So as a Lehigh County Commissioner, he's perfectly um, uh, situated in order to bring us the story of these LNG rail cars and why they are such a bad idea and threaten our region. So Bob, go right ahead. Thank you. I'm going to stop my screen sharing and let you start yours. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, and just to add a little bit as well, uh, I, I've also been a business startup business person, an entrepreneur, so I understand the commercial side of things and what motivates people to do certain things on the commercial side, which is very important to why this even exists as, a, as an issue out there. So let me bring up my screen and we'll get this started. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, very good. Um, I also served as 12 years uh, writing uh, uh, regulations for pharmaceutical manufacturing equipment as well as auditing. So uh, I'm very familiar with regulatory issues and regulatory language because I'll be talking about that at the, towards the very end. So let's begin. There are three elements to what I'll talk about very quickly and I'll move as quickly as I can. Uh, it's going, there's going to be issues with re regard to commerce, public safety, and government regulations with a question mark. And you'll understand further on why there's a question mark there. What is LNG? It's liquefied natural gas, as Tracy had mentioned. Uh, it is composed primarily of methane uh, with a few other trace components in it. But the, the, the main actor in here is, is methane. Uh, so, uh, and as, as Tracy mentioned, the source is the Marcella Shale area up in the north, northern part of the state uh, where there's nothing up there commercially to make use of this really other than um, uh, small uses. So the vast majority of the gas has to go somewhere uh, to be uh, of use commercially. And there's a, there's a tremendous amount of it up there. So the methane component, uh, it's important because it's a basic building block for, orga for organic compounds. In other words, it's used as feedstock for all the plastics that, that are made virtually. Uh, and, and, and so if you stop and think about that, uh, the, the, the commercial potential there is, is tremendous. In addition to that, it it's also serves as a fuel in the form of natural gas, which also has a, a tremendous amount of demand now that everybody's trying to move away from coal into that uh, second tier before you get to renewables. Now, I'd like to concentrate for a minute on the liquefied portion of the natural gas. Uh, this is the engineering part and the geeky, little bit of the geeky stuff. So please bear with me because it's important for context. How do you create it? Well, the gas is squeezed to one six hundredth of its volume, which is a tremendous amount of compression. Uh, if you think about your, your tires in your car, there may be 40, 45 pounds against a, a, a one pound atmosphere or basically atmospheric pressure. So we're talking about 600 times uh, compression as compared to the 40 uh, times compression of your, of your tires. And you know how much energy is in those tires when they blow. Um, further, then the liquid ends up at 260 degrees below zero. To give you a sense of that, uh, liquid, liquid nitrogen is 320 degrees below zero. And liquid, or I'm sorry, CO2, solid CO2, is 100 degrees below zero. So you're getting quite cold. And it takes a lot of work to get uh, the product into this situation. Uh, again, a little bit geeky here. The, this is basically a schematic of the process. The main component here is this device. It's the heat exchanger, which takes the warm gas from the, out of the ground and through various processes, uh, basically cools it down until it gets down to that minus 260 temperature. So if you look at all these components, the key message here is this is something, once you get the process started, you cannot stop it. You have to continue making the product and cooling it down. 
Hence the reason, as Tracy had said, uh, uh, for needing 100 cars uh, twice a day, every day, 365 days a year, uh, you just can't flip this uh, process on and off like a switch. So that's, that's another aspect to this. And that's the reason for the, the vast volume that has to be transported. So how do you transfer? Oh, uh, one quickly, this is a picture from back in the 1970s. These are in the background are LNG heat exchangers. That gives you a sense of the scale. These types of heat exchangers are used in, in uh, the basic gas fields in the Middle East where they're moving far more volume than, than we're talking about here. Uh, so the, the ones that you'll see up in, uh, in the northern part of the state won't be quite as big as this. So transporting the natural gas, you basically, you could do it in three ways. You could do it in a gaseous form through underground pipelines, as Tracy has said. Uh, and quite frankly, from a safety standpoint as a first responder, uh, irrespective, no comment on whether we should even be doing this, but uh, the, the safest way to transport it is through underground pipelines. The next choice uh, commercially would be to transported into rail cars, as Tracy had mentioned, and these uh, rail cars, about 30,000 gallons of capacity each. And finally, you could also transport it in highway tankers uh, in 3,000 3, to 12,000 gallons. And 12,000 gallons are very, very large uh, uh, transports that probably won't even go on our roads right now, legally in Pennsylvania anyway. Uh, Obviously, the most, again, the most efficient would be the gaseous form as well underground. But since there are no pipelines up there that are functional right now, uh, the next best choice, obviously, is by uh, liquid form in the rail cars uh, because of the size of the, of the, of the, of the transports. Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, prior to recently, uh, as Tracy alluded, there was no approval for a design rail car that could function in this capacity. Uh, they, just, they just didn't exist and they weren't uh, regulatory in, in a regulatory uh, approved mode. So I'm gonna take you now into, an, uh, 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 again, the commercial side of the volume. You're talking about several million gallons shipped per day. And as Tracy has said, 100 rail cars twice, twice a day, uh, every day, that's a lot of product. By rail cars, that means 100 plus tank cars. And by highway tankers, you're talking about 1600 trailers a day uh, over our highways and roads. Not very practical and extremely dangerous. So the second element beyond commerce is the public safety aspect of this. Uh, I, I wanna give you a little context in terms of the amount of energy that we're dealing with here. And please, uh, a little disclaimer here, the amount of energy that's here and the, uh, the, the, the information I give you does not indicate that this energy would always be released instantaneously. Uh, it's just to give you a sense of the, of the uh, tremendous amount of energy that they're, they're planning to do and move every day. And again, as Tracy, I'll reiterate what she had said, this has never been done before ever uh, at, this, at this level. So the energy equivalent of one tank car, 30,000 gallons is approximately 620 tons of TNT in terms of energy. The energy equivalent of 100 tank cars in that, in that one tank car or that one uh, rail uh, group of cars that's traveling each day through the areas that Tracy mentioned and also through the Lehigh Valley is equivalent to 60, 62 kilotons. Now, let me put that in perspective. The energy equivalent of Hiroshima nuclear bomb. 14 kilotons of TNT. So that gives you a sense of what we're talking about here in terms of the total energy that's gonna be transported through our area. And energy in that fashion leads to risk. 
So now I'm going to switch hats from the engineering part to the first responder part in the public safety. This is the emergency response guidebook that we as, as first responders in hazmat situations uh, are required to use for guidelines in terms of our actions and how we deal with hazardous material. And uh, trust me, LNG is classified as a hazardous material. These books are available on every single emergency response vehicle throughout the country, Philadelphia and everywhere. You can actually download this if you want. You could Google it on a Google machine and uh, you can download this. I have it on my iPad, I have it on my phone. Uh, we have the same thing on all our response vehicles as well. Uh, and you can, it tells you what to do with regard to an incident uh, with many, many different materials. So we're gonna deal with uh, LNG. This is the guideline for uh, characterization of the potential hazards of LNG. Extremely flammable, will easily ignite by heat, spark, or flames, will form explosive mixtures with air. Vapors from the liquefied gas are heavier than air and spread along the ground. Here we go. Containers may explode when heated. Ruptured cylinders may rocket. So those are the hazards uh, with regard to public safety. What, what is the first responder supposed to do? The guidelines that we're given with regard to, with regard to what our actions are. For large spills and 100 cars, uh, even one car of 30,000 gallons is defined as a large spill by hazmat regulations. So what are we supposed to do as first responders? Consider initial downwind evacuation for at least a half a mile. Now, if there's a fire involved, the, the uh, evacuation distance is one mile in all directions. So think about that uh, map that uh, Tracy showed you going through Philadelphia. And in your mind's eye, uh, look at a path uh, a, a mile on either side of that line and see what's in that path. One of the cautions for our emergency response is do not use water. Use dry chemicals or high expansion foam. Now think about this. If anybody has ever seen uh, uh, an incident where the fire company comes to a scene, what do they come with? They come with trucks and tankers, hoses and water. They don't come with a lot. They have foam, but they don't have a lot. And trust me, there is no emergency response operation in this country that has a sufficient amount of foam to deal with a 30,000 gallon release of this product. None. For massive fires, as a first responder, withdraw from the area and let it burn because you will not, you will not be able to uh, ex extinguish a fire such as this. This is a, uh, a, a, G a, a segment of a GIS map that I had uh, our folks in the IT department do for uh, Lehigh County. And this is a little subset of it just to illustrate uh, that half mile path or the one mile path in the city of Allentown. So in this area right here, there's a, there is a jail and over here, there's a hospital, and there are a number of schools in this area. So uh, when they talk about um, having evacuation limits, trying to evacuate, how could you evacuate uh, a, a significant portion of a city? So think about that from your, your Philadelphia region. I lived down there for about five years. I know the area well, and this would be a, a, a humongous undertaking to uh, do that, that kind of uh, evacuation. Now, let me talk a little bit about government regulations. And this is the part that drives me absolutely bonkers as a regulatory person and, and with regulatory experience and as a first responder. Um, the, uh, as, as Tracy had, had mentioned, uh, the use of these rail cars had been approved by a uh, 
a special request in a, in a uh, ruling that was requested through the Trump administration through the Pipeline and Hazardous Material uh, Safety Administration. And uh, my question here is who regulates the LNG transport? It comes through the US Department of Transportation. And the agency within the US DOT is, I use the acronym FUMSA. It's the Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration. They did the final ruling uh, with regard to the use of this uh, type of transport, the rail car. And uh, it was over 100 pages of text. And they, they uh, came to a final conclusion, a uh, final ruling. They started it in 2018. This is the facing page. And their final ruling was in 2020. Their final ruling after their analysis on this said that we've determined that bulk rail, bulk rail transport is a safe alternative for this energy product. Key word here is bulk. We are talking about a huge amount of product. The analysis didn't go in, didn't speak at all in this uh, ruling with regard to the bulk volume and the safety related to the massive amount of product to be moved. As I read the pages through here, because there were public comment and various organizations, stakeholders put in their comments, uh, which they're legally uh, available to do. And uh, FUMSA had the responsibility legally to respond to all of those comments. So uh, again, as I read through these, I got more and more angry as I went along. I'll try and go through these as quickly as possible to respect your time. Uh, the first one, is my notes uh, the, in the red. This was the direct quote from the, uh, the ruling. The only way LNG can be released from the inner tank of a rail tank car to the void space between the, the tanks is if the inner tank is compromised. My comment, that statement is patently false. As an engineer with intimate knowledge of the, the design and the manufacture of these uh, vessels, I know that there are at least four modes of failure, uh, they only dealt with one. Uh, and this, this statement is, is indeed totally false. Quickly, this is a schematic of, a, of what it looks like, uh, but in a bigger version, I couldn't find exactly what I wanted. It has an inner vessel, uh, which is where the product is at 260 degrees below zero, and an outer vessel, which, is support, which supports the inner vessel and there's a vacuum space in between, just like your thermos bottle. But anybody who's reasonably uh, intelligent would, would recognize that you have product in the inner vessel, you have to get it to the outside world somehow, which means you have to have pipes that connect the two. And those pipes, those red and blue pipes you see here are an additional mechanism of failure, which they never analyzed or addressed at all in their analysis. So some of the comments in here, and I'll run through them fairly quickly. California Public Utilities Commission said, stated that the, the transport of LNG in, in these type of tank cars poses an unacceptable risk. What was FEMSA's response? They basically dis, somewhat, summarily dismissed it without any compelling reasons why. They did not give a reason why they dismissed this comment at all. New York State Department of Transportation Department of Environmental Conservation and New York State Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services. And the NTSB stated that the limited number of incidents involving these kind of tank cars does not provide adequate evidence to ensure that they're safe for transport of LNG. FUMSA responded, they didn't, they said they basically disagreed. In another, re in another region, they basically said it's not possible to state with certainty whether a blevy, I'll explain that, is possible in a case of LNG car derailment and what conditions need to be present for such an event. And essentially what they said, uh, <laughs> double negative, was that a potential hazard need not be considered simply because it can't be accurately predicted. For a first responder, that's absolutely an insane statement because what first responders do 
is plan for and work towards understanding what they can do to unexpected and uncertain events. And this, this blew my mind when I saw this. It just was a total head shaker. Folks, this is what a blevy is. It's a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. Uh, and that's what happens in certain cases, not in all cases of a, of a uh, unplanned and uncontrolled release of product. But it can happen. NTSB and other commenters said that a complete and thorough crash worthiness and safety assessment uh, is needed. And the current analysis that they did uh, in this ruling does not provide a statistically significant valid safety assessment. What did FUNSA say? They dismissed it summarily without any reasons. The International Association of Firefighters suggested they uh, conduct an expansive assessment. National Association of State Fire Marshals noted that 19 uh, cars wouldn't trigger key train requirements, but it was a large enough quantity to, to, to produce significant hazards. Other commenters, including the IAFF, International Association of Firefighters, comment, and this is what I had said earlier, there's no pot, it's not possible in, in, in uh, any jurisdictions across the United States or most that you would be able to evacuate people within a one mile radius. Think about that in Philadelphia. They also further stated that the, the, uh, an incident involving multiple cars would place a large number of the public in, ri in at risk while depleting uh, many communities of emergency response resources. Believe me, something like this would require a, a vast uh, response by all the fire uh, uh, emergency responders in the area. What did FUMSA say? They disagrees that the one mile evacuation distance is not possible without any rationale, reasoning, or support for that statement. So in summary, the financial pressures for massive commercialization of the Marcellus natural gas resources are enormous. There's a ton and a tremendous amount of money to be made here. So the inertia is moving forward uh, with a great deal of strength. Also, the commercial chess pieces are moving in place without much public interest. There's work being done up uh, in, in, at the northern end with the uh, liquefaction process. They're playing with that and putting that equipment in. Nobody's really paying attention to it in the general public. It's not, you don't hear publicized. Uh, as Tracy had mentioned, the facility down uh, at the Delaware River, uh, there's, there's some visibility there, but we need much more. But it, it, they're all kind of coming into play in little places here and there, and no one's looking at, no one is truly looking at the big picture. And this is my statement, the arrogance of the FIMSA organization is just absolutely astounding and it's going virtually unchallenged. Uh, and from my experience in my, that technical field, I know for a fact that they did an absolutely terrible job in this analysis. Finally, the public safety impact on Pennsylvania and throughout the entire US, because as, as Tracy mentioned, this uh, approval or this actual the ruling has basically said that this can be done anywhere in the entire United States. And the public safety impact has not been analyzed and, and, and determined uh, completely. So with that, I have a ton of other information. I had to cut this way short for the time limit to respect your time, but thank you very much. I'll thank you very much, Bob. Let me see. And um, you can bring your, this. yeah, go ahead and bring your screen share down. Um, so at this time, I'd like to introduce Fermin Morales, and he's going to talk to, with us about the communities that are in harm's way. Uh, Fermin's camera is not working, but you will be able to hear him. Go ahead, Fermin. Yes, um, how you doing? My name is uh, Fermin Morales. I'm part of also a Philly Boricuas, the organization. I'm also an electrician by trade. And 
Some of the area codes will, which will be directly in, in, impacted by these trains passing by is 19140, 19133, 19132, 19124, and 19137. The reason I mentioned these, these uh, zip codes is because four of these zip codes are actually four of the poorest areas of the city. In fact, I think they are the four poorest areas of the city of Philadelphia. There's close to about 200,000 people that will be directly affected by these trains passing by, by these zip codes. Also, if, if, if the other rail line was used, which it would be a lot closer to where I live at, which is the area code of 19133. 19133 is the poorest zip code in the city of Philadelphia. And um, for those of you who know, if an accident were to happen, I will, can guarantee you that there would just be a slap on the wrist on this, organ, on this corporation. And if the city of Philadelphia at this particular point is there are 10 cities in the US with over a million people population of those cities, Philadelphia is the poorest. An accident like this will create even more poverty in, in the city of Philadelphia. The reason why I say this also, these trains will be, be delivering um, this liquefied natural gas to parts of the world, one of which will be Puerto Rico, also Ireland. The issue in Puerto Rico was that we already had a project of this sort back in uh, the year 2009 to 2012. And they, they were trying to build gas pipelines through the center of the island, 92 miles of gas pipelines. And um, they were trying to sell it at, as a project called Via Verde, which, which translates pretty much in Spanish to the Greenway. You know, there's nothing green about, about this project. And so people started fighting this project, you know, and, and it was being pushed by the governor at the time. And um, as they kept pushing it, there was, there was an organization in Puerto Rico called Casa Pueblo, which pretty much translates to the people's house. And this, this, this organization, which had its own engineers in a small town called Ajuntas, uh, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, and um, they did their own study and they had to contradict even the Army Corps of Engineers of the United States and, and show that this project wasn't viable, this project was dangerous, this project was actually going to expropriate people from their lands, it was going to destroy underground rivers, uh, you know, Pretty much, you know, the landmass in that area. If there were farmers, their crop could be destroyed. Just, just to, just to have us, pretty much, um, as you pay, say, dependent on outside resources. When we had our own resources in Puerto Rico, that 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 were much, much better to use. And all of you know that if you go to Puerto Rico, it, it has plenty of sun, you know, and, and clean energy would be a whole lot better for that. And um, you know. And this, you know, it was a lot of people getting paid even before this was was even was even built. So there are people right now making money simply on this project without without even even being started. And and and, and that's the whole sham of all this, you know, that they're already making money, you know, to, to in this project just just to just to even start it. And um, that's pretty much what 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 I have to say. And um, and um, it's just going that project. It's going to pass through my neighborhood. So I'm going to be directly uh, affected with it, you know, because I am from 19133 and you know there's a lot of people here suffering already from poverty. This would just be another addition to it. Uh thank you very much. Thank you for men. Thank you for representing the community in Philadelphia, particularly the Puerto Rican neighborhood that's right in harm's way. Uh, I'd like to introduce now Adrian Rivera Reyes. Uh, he's also from Philly Barrequas, and he's going to be talking about the Puerto Rico connection and the alternatives. Go ahead, Adrian. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Adrian, and I am a member of Philly Barrequas. We are a community organization, um, mostly working with the Puerto Rican diaspora in Philly, that the majority lives in North Philly, where these trains are going to go through, um, and which Fermin just spoke so eloquently about. So thank you, Fermin. Um, 
I want to be short because I know we're a little bit behind on the schedule, but um, Fermin gave a good background on what happened in 2009, in 2009 with the pipeline that was trying to happen, um, you know, today and back then and now today we join our communities, this time in Philly and Puerto Rico, and of course all over the diaspora um, to reject this project. Um, Fracking, of course, is terrible. Transporting LNG is, of course, terrible in many, many ways. Obviously, from the climate front, which I know um, most of you today here or tonight here um, know a lot about that. Um, you know, it affects many things such as air quality or water sources um, and whatnot. And we know that the effects of climate change affect the most vulnerable and uh, majority working class and poor communities the most. In Puerto Rico, as you probably know, we had two devastating hurricanes in 2017. Um, and, and that was, you know, part of um, climate change, right? And this is another project that will only exacerbate those types of uh, natural phenomenon. Um, but additionally, right, um, this port that they're trying to build is an export. Um, port. Um, and they're trying to bring LNG or part of the business model is to bring LNG to places like Puerto Rico to sell it. And um, this is also an extension of U.S. colonialism and imperialism because, right, because it's part of making Puerto Rico dependent on, um, on dirty fossil fuels, non-clean energy. And like Fermin mentioned, Puerto Rico is a country that is rich in natural resources. Um, we have an, an incredible location where we can have a lot of uh, wind power, also solar energy. There is sun everywhere all the time, and it is incredible. And most importantly, you know, to wrap this up really quickly is that Puerto Rico really deserves energy independence and especially energy independence from the United States. And our families, my family in Puerto Rico and my family in Philly deserve also to live in safe neighborhoods, to be safe from the threat of LNG going through their neighborhoods and their backyards. Um, and, you know, and, and I'm happy and, and glad to be part of this panel today. Um, and thank you, Tracy for and everyone and all the organizers for hosting this. Um, and I will pass the baton at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian, And I uh, appreciate your representation for uh, of this issue and what our alternatives are. So um, I'd like to uh, next introduce our, our next speaker, um, which is uh, Mitch Channon. And he's gonna be talking about the petition that we're launching tonight and how you can get involved. Go ahead, Mitch. Great, I'm gonna keep it really, really brief. I'm Mitch Chan and I work with 350 Philly and a bunch of other groups here in Philly. I'm really, really glad to be here with the other speakers tonight. Um, as, as Tracy said, um, the permit, the special permit that was issued last year that will uh, allow this project to happen expires at the end of November. And we want to speak out and try to get as many people as possible to send a message to the Biden administration that we want the permit to be rescinded now and at a minimum not renewed when it expires. Um, the petition also addresses the, um, the other general permit that Tracy mentioned that would allow LNG to be moved around the country. Um, it's a bit convoluted to like really dig into the intricacies of the importance of each permit but we spent a lot of time thinking about it and we you know we thought that the the primary goal should be to stop the special permit um but we also want to reference the general permit um it will be harder for them much harder for them to move the project forward if the special permit is not renewed and just to to lift up a couple of things that bob said earlier there's a lot of there's very widespread opposition to this practice of moving LNG by train. A lot of institutions, um, including people with, with really strong credentials as safety experts have said that they believe 
this is too dangerous to be allowed, including the International Association of Firefighters, the National Transportation Safety Board, and many more. And there's a lawsuit um, challenging the general permit that I believe includes 15, or maybe it's now 16 state attorneys general plus the uh, attorney general in, in the District of Columbia. So um, yeah, so there's very wide opposition and we submitted an earlier petition with 70,000 signatures to an agency that could have rejected the construction of the export terminal, although they declined to do that at the time. So we're gonna launch this new petition. Um, it, uh, there is a paper petition available um, or a, a printable petition and there's an online petition. Um, Tracy's gonna share the links for those. We're gonna have follow-up meetings to talk about how to, um, to get those out, how to get the thousands of signatures that we'll need and then how we'll deliver them. I know there's a lot of other um, questions in the chat and the Q&A box about um, possibilities for folks in New Jersey to add their voices um, and ideas for getting local um, elected officials to speak out. And we can address all those in follow-up strategy meetings as well. Those are all really good ideas. We don't have time to go into them now, but we will talk about all these strategy ideas and wanna support every possible, every viable path to building opposition to this project. Um, and I'll note also just in closing that um, we had a sign-on letter back in September, I believe, that included um, dozens of local officials, city council members and state legislators here in Philly. And we may wanna reach back out to them around trying to push, push the Biden administration. Um, Tracy shared the links in the chat. We'll also send a follow-up email that includes the links for all the petition items and everyone will be invited to follow-up meetings to strategize together about how we can, how we can move the petitions. And that's all I have. Thank you so much to everyone for coming tonight and to all the organizers. And I turn it back to you, Tracy. Yes, thank you very much, Mitch. Appreciate that. And um, now we're gonna be going to questions and answers. I apologize that we are so far behind. Um, we're 15 minutes behind and I, I, I'm very sorry for that. I do wanna say that the petitions are available both in English and Spanish. Um, and we have an online petition um, that I just showed the bit.ly for. It'll be, it's also just been put into the chat for the English version, the Spanish version will go live tomorrow and everybody who registered will get that link as well. So Tammy, I'll turn it over to you um, for questions and answers. I just wanna say, I see in, in the Q&A, there's a lot of questions about New Jersey. We're focusing on Philadelphia tonight. We had a webinar on New Jersey. We're happy to have another one on New Jersey, but what we stop here with the special permit will also benefit New Jersey because it will stop the transport of LNG by rail from Wyalusing to Gibbstown. Go ahead, Tammy. Okay, so um, I'm sure some of you have to go at eight and it's only one minute till eight, um, but we will go through some of these questions and if you can stick with us, that's wonderful. So we'll get started right away. I'm gonna start with the earliest question. I answered as many of them as I could. Um, and uh, panelists, let me know if you are um, chomping at the bit to answer this. Can you discuss the areas of New Jersey that are impacted, specifically wondering about Gloucester uh, County? Uh, we'd like to keep this quick because this is supposed to be focused on Philadelphia. Yeah, like I mentioned, we, we um, can have another webinar focused on, the New, on New Jersey, but um, yes, Gloucester County, uh, it crosses at the Delaware Bridge um, and then it ends th there at, in Pensacon Township, then it moves south on the South Freight Rail <laughs> and goes all the way through Camden County. It goes through Camden, and then it moves south um, all the way down to Gibbstown, New Jersey, exposing about 10 municipalities along the way, in addition to the Camden County municipalities. Municipalities in New Jersey did pass resolutions against this project when we were mobilizing in December to try to get the DRBC to not approve this project, um, but they have begun again. And there have just been uh, three more resolutions passed in Gloucester County communities. So yay for the people uh, in the municipalities in Gloucester County. Please email me and we'll be happy to connect you up with that movement. It's got new life and it's very exciting. Great, thank you, Tracy. Okay, so the next one, um, I think this might be to you, Tracy, because it came right after your introduction. If you could um, either maybe share a link in the chat or go over those three permits a little slower. I know you just popped a link into the chat. 
Yeah, I'll put it in the chat, but it's the Army Corps of Engineers. That's the federal permit from that agency. It's under appeal. It's the Delaware River Basin Commission, where the 70,000 petition signature, signatures went and where hundreds upon hundreds of people attended their meeting when they were going to be voting, a huge outpouring of opposition from the region. And um, they went ahead and approved it. That's under appeal. Um, they are represented by the governors of the four states and the federal government. So I saw there was a question about where's Governor Wolf on this. He voted to approve the project through his position as commissioner on the Delaware River Basin Commission. So I think that speaks volumes. Also, um, there has been uh, approvals given in the past for the premise for the Wyalusing plant. I just also want to say there is tremendous opposition that has grown against the Wyalusing facility. So yeah. Bob, I want to let you know that that project is not under construction. It has been stopped. Um, they say it's because of COVID, but um, they did let their, their permit go up to the very last minute and then it has, they applied for an application just last week to have it extended. And there is a legal fight that will be mounted to stop it. So there is opposition at every uh, turn now for this project and we believe it's mounting. So um, the other permit that I mentioned is the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. It's a permit they must have, it's for the waterfront development. We are appealing it um, and we actually have filed a petition with the New Jersey Supreme Court to hear our case on that. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. You just answered Ruth's question also um, about how they can fight it in New Jersey. Um, the next question is, is rail, is rail transport cheaper than a pipeline, especially a pipeline that doesn't exist yet? Bob, I don't know if you want to answer that. I just want to do want to say they do not move liquid natural gas in pipelines. So this issue of pipelines versus you know bomb trains, we don't want pipelines, we don't want bomb trains. In terms of economics, they save a lot of money by putting it all into these big, long, what Bob described, these hundred car trains, these unit trains, um, when you compare it to tank trucks. But I can tell you that according to all the applications that New Fortress Energy has submitted, they wanna do both. They wanna move it by tank truck and they wanna move it by rail. So they want to, They don't care that the, they're trying to turn our entire region and all the, the 1.56 million people along the transportation route into a sacrifice zone. Um, and that, because of, of the economics of this, we believe that the rail cars are probably the one thing that they really want to, to use in order to move the product, because they can do a lot more quicker. Okay, Bob, do you want to answer too? Yeah, the cheapest way would be to move the gas through pipelines and liquefy it uh, in Philadelphia or in New Jersey, wherever, nearest to the port, and then put it right on the ship. That's what they do in the Middle East. That's what they're doing in Texas. All of the Texas uh, gas that's, that's converted is is piped through vast number of pipelines in, in Texas right to the to the ocean and that's where they liquefy it and put it on the ship but uh, from the standpoint of uh, cost uh, the, the rail cars the next best bet and uh, the, the the most expensive is the is over the road on the trailers and in either case I did answer that on uh, there, there aren't enough trailers right now available to do this uh, and there aren't, there aren't enough rail cars to do it because it's a new design. So it's gonna take a while for them to even get up to speed to get to that volume by, to manufacture the equipment. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. I, Tammy, let me just add that the one thing that Bob mentioned is really important. And I mentioned it at the top. It's very unusual to have natural gas liquefied out in the countryside and right. then carried for right. hundreds of miles um, th there's no other place in the United States that this is going on. That's why it, it has never been tested. That's why it is what New Fortress en Energy thinks is some bright idea. In fact, it's not. It doesn't make economic sense and it certainly doesn't make environmental or public health uh, or safety sense. Okay, thank you. We're gonna move on to the truck transportation, which I answered earlier is basically the default. Um, so if transported via truck, is it possible for local municipalities or even PennDOT to regulate or deny the ability to transport through certain areas or neighborhoods? And Donna, you also just put in the chat a comment about the toxicity of having that many trucks. 
um, added to our uh, existing traffic? Well, the, tr the trucks certainly pose equal safety um, and environmental issues. It's just that there are not as many of them in one place at one time. Um, but Bob, I don't know if you want to uh, answer the other part of that question, but um, you know, I could add to it. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I don't believe that the municipalities would have any control whatsoever over the ability of these vehicles to, to travel the, the, the uh, roads. In fact, every day there are trailers that on the, on the highways that are transporting liquid hydrogen, which is just as dangerous. But again, you're not talking about 1,600 trucks. Uh, you may have a truck here, truck there. But if you think about it, and I, I, I can't remember the numbers I, I, I ran, just to come down the turnpike, you can sit there on a turnpike uh, on a bridge and watch the trucks come by every minute or two to get to 1,600 trucks. Uh, that's a huge volume, huge. Uh, and I, I don't believe even, even PennDOT would have the ability to stop it in any fashion simply because there is precedent for it. Those trailers those are approved for that use. Again, it's the bulk, it's the volume that we're talking about here. As Tracy mentioned, it's never been done before. And also we checked with all of the federal and state transportation agencies. And they said they don't need to do anything to get approval to move it by truck. All they have to do is placard the trucks properly, period. So there's yep. no environmental or public safety analysis at all. And let me add to truck. that, from a safety standpoint with the trucks, if there's a rollover on the highway and you have leakage, uh, you've got instant ignition sources by every other vehicle nearby because of the catalytic converters. It, it's almost guaranteed that it's gonna go up in one of those, what's called the blebby. Okay, I am also just typing in a little bit um, of an answer from a different movement. Um, I know the nuclear uh, non-proliferation movement um, was able to secure restrictions um, for uh, nuclear weapons material coming through different cities. Um, so then the next question, um, we have gotten most of them done. On the positive side, I don't see a way uh, they can transport the same volume on the highway um, and um, so much less that it, it might not be profitable. So can someone just Well, they have a, th their application um, says that they want to move three to 400 trucks, tank trucks each day from Wyalusing uh, down to Gibbstown. Now that application is separate from the LNG by rail special permit. So um, they've already said that it's in the Army Corps of Engineers permit. Um, get this, Gloucester County actually got funding from New Jersey State to pay to build a special turnoff from the highway into the Gibbstown site in order to carry these trucks. So we're, and, and according to the, the transportation analysis that was done by the agency that did the environmental impact analysis for that, um, that uh, bypass, um, 1,650 trucks a day are expected. So all these numbers of 300 and 400 here and, and another you know, two 100 car rail, we don't really know what New Fortress Energy is doing. And they have told a different story um, in almost every application they have, they have uh, filed. Uh, they tell different agencies different things. Very hard to figure out what they're actually doing. But I think we have to plan for the worst and, and fight the worst in order to get them to stop. Okay, uh, we are finished with the questions that were in the Q&A. So thank you everybody for doing that uh, with great speed. I appreciate it. And it's uh, only 10 minutes after eight, so we didn't do too bad. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, the panelists, for speaking. Thank you so much, Tracy, for putting this together and for guiding us through from the beginning to the end. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you so everybody. much for attending. Thank you for everybody. attending. Thank yeah. you, Tammy. Thank you, everyone that came.